Hi, welcome back. We're here at Hope 2020. I want to give a big shout out to our attendees, presenters, and volunteers. Thank you very much. Our next session is with Johannes Gunfrother, who is an artist, filmmaker, writer, performer, and researcher. And he's here to present the wonderful world of cocktail robotics. So stay tuned, hit the Matrix chat for questions, and we're going to go ahead and take it right to his presentation. See you in a minute. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen of whatever gender you prefer. Welcome to another presentation at HOPE. And hello at the Monochrome headquarters here in Vienna, Austria. Austria is primarily known for music and mass murder, but we're not going to talk about that today. My name is Johannes Grenzfurtner, and uh, I'm an artist. <laughs> Well, I'm also a technologist and uh, a filmmaker and a consultant. And that means I'm also an insultant because uh, that's sometimes how you have to do it. And people actually pay you for that. It's very strange. Well, I laugh about stuff like that. Or that. And I think it's very true what you can read here. Do what you love and you will work super fucking hard all the time with no separation or any boundaries and also take everything extremely personally. I am uh, the founder and still member of Monochrome. Monochrome is an art technology philosophy collective based here in Austria and uh, I want to introduce you to my co-host today and the co-host is... One second. <coughs> The spirit in the machine. It is a big pleasure for me to be here, Johannes. Art is a very special thing. It is a special place for special people in a really bad font. And I have a little bit of a problem with it, although I'm an artist. The problem is, is that what we call art and the art market is only 250 years old. It's an invention of uh, capitalism. So what I think we all should do is overcome art. We have to come to that point where art is so part of everyday life. We all do it that uh, it kind of disappears. We call ourselves context hackers because the context of something is really, really important. If you put something in a gallery or into a nightclub completely changes the piece. And hacking. I like the term hacking because hacking means to do something with a technological or social system that you shouldn't do with it. There is a form of appropriation and misappropriation. Context hacking transfers the hackers' objectives and methods to the network of social relationships in which artistic production occurs and upon which it is dependent. There is always a way to get a message across, but sometimes you need a couple of adapters. I personally want to create emotional machines. That doesn't mean that I necessarily have to create machines all the time, but an emotional machine is also a good story. If you tell a good story, if you watch a movie and that movie works for you, then that's an interesting emotional machine. Because everything in that piece of art, everything in that piece of storytelling works and pushes the right buttons. In the end, you can have a lot of debates if Titanic is a good or bad film. But if you cry in the end, the emotional machine worked. There is an element of storytelling, of politics and of technology that I'm interested in. And I try to combine those elements pretty much in all the pieces that I do. One of Context Hacker's central ambitions is to bring the factions of counterculture, which have veered off along widely diverging trajectories, back together again. We have to go back a little bit to the year 1986. I was 11 years old in 1986, and that was a pretty bad year for modernity because number one, the Challenger blew up. Number two, 
Chernobyl exploded. And number three, at least uh, for Europe, Jörg Haider came to power. And that meant that he created the blueprint for uh, all the right-wing populist um, parties that you see uh, in Europe, but pretty much like also all over the world. It was the time that I started reading cyberpunk and sci-fi and all that stuff. I was a very nerdy person. I also watched Robocop and similar films, and I was very much interested in this like near future society. So what will happen in the next 25 years? It was the year that I got my first computer. I remember when I got a new device for my computer, I connected it to the phone line and the device sang a robot love song to a device on the other end of the line. That made the devices connect and I could go online and exchange messages, download images. And that was one of the most important things that ever happened to me because it helped me connect to other folks all around the globe. Communication is key in nerd culture, but we have to be aware that if that communication fails, you will create a toxic troll wasteland and uh, not even robot love songs will save you. That's how I looked like, and it was also the time when I downloaded my first porn image from a German BBS from Austria. It took six hours to download it, and uh, I think I even came before the first like 12% were downloaded because I was so... Uh, that was the start for me to be interested in things that I did not have direct contact to. Books, files, all kinds of weird information and um, we were also already entering the 1990s. I started reading Ian M. Banks and uh, uh, the Industrial Culture Handbook by Research. I got interested in projects by the Survival Research Lab or by Stellark. I was a classic post-punk. The revolution that punk created was still kind of like echoing through culture when I grew up, when I was 15, 16 years old. Punk was, and you have to remind yourself of that, also a technological revolution and a DIY revolution. Most of the consumer technology out there in the 1970s and 1980s was technology that uh, baby boomer parents bought and used it in a really boring way. Like, you know, like Polaroid cameras, cassette recorders, uh, videotaping systems, video cameras, that kind of stuff, Xerox machines. The punk kids of the 1970s and 1980s took the consumer electronic their parents never used and used that technology in a creative and interesting way. They started bands, they started creating fanzines, they started uh, doing interesting experiments with electronic uh, devices. It's also the time the first hackerspaces emerge. And that positive creative abuse of technology is something that enormously shaped me. That's how I looked like back then. And it was the time around 1992 and 1993 that I wanted to create something and I called it monochrome. The basic idea was to form something like an organization that could do interesting projects. We started with a fanzine because the basic idea was how can we teach people about the cool stuff that's going on in our life and our sphere of interest and how can we learn from them so we somehow have to get our hands on them. So we thought a magazine, a fanzine is a good way. At the same time we realized, well, only people who are interested in underground culture are interested in fanzines or even know what a fanzine is. Many people that we would like to talk to, we thought, are not online. So what could we do? And uh, it was a little bit of a dilemma. The basic question is, if no one wants to listen, how can you actually send out messages that people understand and want to hear? So the basic approach of Monochrome since the 1990s didn't change. We want to find the perfect weapon of mass distribution of an idea to find the right medium to tell a story. And I mean, there are many media out there, so you can try. So we started as a fanzine, but not that many people read fanzines. We tried political pamphlets, but eh, not that many people are interested in that. So why not try 
creating a puppet show or a computer game or a performance on the street or a musical or a movie or a theater play. Sometimes we even bury people alive. We do that because we want to teach people about uh, medicine. We want to teach people about the history of the idea of death and how that changed over the centuries. If we look around in our office, we definitely find things uh, from like three decades of our projects. All the leftovers that we don't need anymore, we store them somewhere here or put them on the wall. And if you look around, you can always spot something that is related to robots. Uh, for example, here. For example, here. In 1999, something magical happened. It was the birth year of Robo Exotica. And Robo Exotica is the festival for cocktail robotics. And we are creating it together with shifts ever since, for 21 years now. And I can tell you, I've seen a lot of weird shit at Robo Exotica. First of all, why cocktail robots? Well, people like cocktails, people like parties, and people like robots. So why not combine those elements and actually attract a crowd of people to go there? At Robo Exotica, we're interested in machines that mix cocktails, serve cocktails, light or smoke cigarettes, offer bar food, or have bar conversations. That's a great Turing test right there. So first of all, we have to ask ourselves, what is a robot? So we published a book about Robo Exotica a couple of years ago, and there are some nice definitions here. A machine that looks like a human being and has the capacity to perform human tasks. That's from Webster's Dictionary. Well, I'm not sure I agree with that because really, why does it have to look like a human? Hmm. Ah, we'll see. Well, we have an intelligent connection of perception to action. That's from the Mobile Robots uh, book. Well, I kind of like that. And what's that? Your plastic pal who's fun to be with. From the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm. How incredibly great, Johannes. Let's hear a passage from that book. Ever since the cocktail of primeval muds sped out human spirit out of evolutionary euphoria, that spirit was eager to create tools of ever-growing extravagancy in order to hand over all the dangerous, annoying and boring work. Currently robotics is the result of this development. The central question is how to transfer the efficiency of human actions onto a couple of chips in a metal case. Result: Our world is inhabited by vast amounts of semi-pseudo-intelligent gizmos whose overall presence remains unnoticed but which spare us plenty of everyday struggles. ATMs, production halls, subways. The lawn is always neatly trimmed if the solar-driven lawn mower circles automatically. That's all a little bit boring if you ask me. Back in the post-war years, our society was on the threshold to becoming a modernist utopian society. It was the chance to reorganize the political economy on the basis of technological progress. This has been the promise of progress ever since. In the long run, technology would free us from the hardships of work and bring about a life of endless leisure time, eventually replacing survival with culture on the human to-do list. A post-industrious society seemed to be within reach. Robots were the main agents of this scenario and it was collectively hallucinated that they would enter our households to take over all the stupid and annoying work that needs to be done anyway. Our manifesto reads the following. Since the 1960s, the AI researchers are stuck in an eternal spasm of intelligence. The first efforts to create artificial intelligence date back to the 1960s, just when Armstrong was plodding around in Mare Tranquillitatis. Modernity had invested its victory prey in moon rocks and everything seemed possible. The first artificial brain was foreseen to exist at the turn of the century. In fact, 
I do not even trust my toaster. The cocktail was the perfect symbol of a life pointing towards bourgeois post-work utopia. It stood for a tasty, mundane and cosmopolitan indulgence. It comprised only the best ingredients from all over the colonized world most of which incorporated whispers of far-off paradises in the way tropical fruits do. Cocktails were messengers from a world that economically aims at one's benefit, still oblivious of the ecological rundown of the idea of global economics lying just a few years ahead. Plus, the cocktail also stands for human inventiveness with the tricky, soft technological procedure to mix one and the never-ending flow of new recipes and mixtures developed on the basis of trial and error. So, the question was, if cocktail robots do not exist in 1999, who can create them for us? So the idea was to start a festival where we would actually challenge people out there to create a cocktail robot and deal with the complex environment of a cocktail bar in a robotic way. People are interested in robots. People like cocktails and drinking and a bar atmosphere. So people come to our event primarily because they want to see how this stuff looks like, if it works, if it fails or not. But most of the time they just hang out there and talk. But they don't only talk about themselves and with their friends, they start talking about the machines. They start talking about technology. Taking all this into account, we might even suggest that cocktails are the most concise signs of human culture on the threshold to postmodernism. Robo Exotica's aim was to connect people from all over the world who are working on the same project and to introduce others to the idea and get them to join in. Plus, practice without theory is no practice at all but merely something that looks like Mr. Bean trying to park his car. You suddenly see guests like talking to the creators of the machines, looking into the guts of the machines, asking how did that work? How did you make that? How did you solve that problem? And in the end, we have so many people who come back to Robo Exotica the next year, but not as guests, but with their own little cocktail robot. And it doesn't even matter if the machine works perfectly. You know, like we are not a tech startup. The wonderful thing about Robo Exotica is to see interesting, wonderful approaches to technology that you wouldn't see anywhere else. This combination of exhibition and interesting talks about futurology drew international attention towards the festival and we were able to get top class speakers from all over the world for the event, like activist and science fiction author Cory Doctorow. I've seen so many robot suicides at Robo Exotica, I can't even cry anymore. There's this wonderful story and I'm so sorry that we can't show you a video of that, but a friend of mine built a machine and it had a plexiglass casing and he brought the machine and he was very proud and he put it on the table and he turned it on and it should mix its first drink. And you could actually see the glass in the plexiglass container and the glass would fill up with a wonderful screwdriver, but it didn't stop. It kind of overflowed and there was still like more alcohol coming, more alcohol coming and the whole robot drowned in its own alcohol. The thing never delivered a single cocktail, only the one that killed itself. So what can you say? We've never been interested in the new just in itself, but in the accidental occurrence, in the moment where things don't tally, where productive confusion arises, Failure is opportunity, Johannes. Here's a video from 1999 and Jesus non-existent Christ. That is fucking punk. Look at that. Vergangenen Freitag fand im Kulturzentrum Wex in der Zentergasse der erste nationale Cocktail Robot Award statt. And here is a video from the last year. That's a very nice robot arm. But it's kind of something that you would expect. 
I really like the guys and it's a really great machine, but there's, there's something missing. So what is missing? Maybe something that you can see in this machine here. This is what I would call heavy machinery. Robomachi is the most inefficient and most beautiful mojito making robot in the known universe. It's uh, moving the chain with compressed air. So it is enormously loud. You can't stand next to it and have a conversation. You'll probably lose your hearing. Cheers to that, Johannes. This machine here makes a layered cocktail out of different forms of alcohol. It is very, very beautiful. And here we have the Robo Jesus. Robo Jesus is a contraption that changes water into wine. So you have to pour in water and the machine actually will serve wine. The machine was created by someone who worked for Pixar. <laughs> you kind of see it in the design of the machine. This machine from Russia delivers a cocktail, but as steam. It turns absinthe into vapor and you inhale it through the brain of a dead sheep. What a lovely story, Johannes. Let's have a look at the video that was taken in 2010, so 10 years ago, to give you a little overview of how Robo Exotica looks like. <laughs> This is a very analog arcade game. It's called Shotbot, and by using the joystick, you would actually move a camera and a little pipe. You would aim the camera and the pipe at the face of a person, push fire, and it would spit vodka at that person. So you would have to try to hit the mouth of the person you would actually like to give vodka to. Sometimes that didn't really work that well, so people got it in their eyes, but uh, uh, the good thing is that we're not in America and we don't have to sign damage waivers if people go to an event like that. This is a neat machine called Plasmastaub. That is a special form of counterculture or over-the-counter culture. Robo Exotica works on a collective interface to remind us of the pristine idea of robots serving us and to focus again on the full cultural meaning of robots. Capitalist slaves for all tomorrow's cocktail parties. 
Over the years, we have seen that more and more cocktail robots use a form of gamification approach. Cigarette. Oh my God. I do want a cigarette. What's yeah. your name? Gordon. Gordon. Hi. Yeah. Gordon. We are two um, yeah, artists from Vienna and we built uh, the web bot. Web means uh, uh, to throw in Dutch because we developed it in the uh, Netherlands. Uh, don't ask why, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, that's a fact. And we have here a nicotine cybernetics machine. Uh, the input is uh, the demanding smoker, he wants a cigarette, he's starving for cigarettes, so he just shout out Chick, which means uh, Siggy in Austrian slang. Okay. And yeah, then the robot starts uh, its procedure and yeah, he will throw you a cigarette directly into your mouth. Okay. My name is Leo Pesta and yeah. I'm and you worked on the machine together? Yes, we worked together, we kind of um, did all the hardware and software together because we are uh, both media artists and work in this field for several years now. and. Okay. Yeah, so he, he provided us with Gigasms because with geek he, he was he was <laughs> re responsible for the face detection, calculating the triangle between eyes and mouth, okay. and then we know kind of precise where the mouth should be and can try to find it and shoot a cigarette to it. Oh. This machine here, for example, only gives you a cocktail if you win a bicycle race against your opponent. We have also seen that with computer games, one group created a form of snake. So you would play the snake computer game and you would have to collect um, lemons and cherries and stuff like that. And by collecting those items, you would actually mix your cocktail. You would get cherry juice or lime juice or whiskey. So only by really playing well, you would actually get a good drink. Alcohol was pretty much a concrete mixer full of screwdriver. And you would have to get on the floor in front of it with a funnel and it would tilt itself and pour alcohol into the funnel. So it was pretty much a mixture of a cocktail machine and a waterboarding device. We don't know why, but there was a malfunction and 60 liters of screwdriver were dumped onto the floor. And the bad part was that all the electrical outlets were in the floor. <laughs> what was bad about the situation was that almost the entire US embassy in Austria was at Robo Exotica that night because we got some funding from them to fly in American artists. So we almost electrocuted the entire US embassy in Austria, cocktail terrorism. One of my favorite contraptions in that arena was a game where you would actually wear a backpack. So you would be mobile and you would play against an opponent also wearing a backpack. The basic concept was a laser tag game. So you would run around through all the guests on all the different levels of Robo Exotica and shoot at each other but you would only get ammunition to shoot the other person if you would suck vodka out of your backpack. And of course, the more you suck out of your backpack, it's a little bit harder for you to aim and shoot. We do not encourage binge drinking at Robo Exotica, but sometimes robots make that very hard for you. We had one machine that was actually trying to find out with a facial recognition system who is the most drunk person in the room, it would follow that person and give that person more alcohol. So in a certain way, it was an escalation machine. We never really knew if that worked and I doubt it that someone built a facial recognition system that can tell you if you're inebriated or not. The people were seeing the robot following them and completely freaking out. No, no, go away, I don't like that. I'm not that drunk, leave me alone. Perfect emotional machines in the best sense. This is a robot dress created by Anouk Wipprecht. It is a truth or dare game. So the person wearing it was walking around at Robo Exotica and offering other people to play a game of truth or dare. And there was the possibility to win a cocktail with that. And this little fellow was really interested in giving you beer. This is good, Johannes. 
This is shot from above, also a game. You would have to get under it, look up and try to catch the drink that's delivered to you by the system. I haven't yet talked about bar food. Of course, bar food is very important. If you go to an event and drink a lot of alcohol, you need something in your stomach, like we call it Unterlage in German. And this is one of my favorite Unterlagenmaschinen. It is the Amalet Tomat. It creates a specific kind of pancake. And it was so popular over the years as a returning contestant that the German TV station saw it and invited Zwax, the creator of the machine, to the TV studio. And here's the little video about it. Johannes. Robo Exotica is a very friendly but also challenging environment. Let's have a look at this machine. It creates the perfect dry martini based on your brainwave patterns, Johannes. Reinhard Sprung wanted to serve the ultimate non-vegan bar food and experimented with the electrocution of sausages. <laughs> he then built an electric chair. Over the years, we have been working together with many hackers, nerds, roboticists and artists in the technological sphere. But we are also in good contact with graphic designers and illustrators uh, for our poster designs, but also with photographers. Here is a wonderful design by Josh Ellingson that we liked so much that we created one of our posters out of it. We just recently published a coffee table book about monochrome and our projects, and there are many pictures of Robo Exotic in it as well. How incredibly great, Johannes. How very, very pleasant, Johannes. We are running out of time. Yeah, you're right. There's this wonderful quote by Michel Foucault. It is not important what you want to know, but why you want to know it. And I know there are many hackers out there many tech people out there and you have questions about technical details and i didn't talk about that at all in my talk because i think honestly it is not that important raspberry pis are not expensive you just get them you play around with them get a pump and that's it the really important aspect is having an idea of putting something into that machine that you really like and that you really want to see. I hope that you will be able to come to Vienna at some point and show your machine. I would be very interested in that. So I'll see you on the other side. Let's do a Q&A. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Please shut up, you bag of vomit. Thanks for uh, help. help. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for coming back with us. We're here with Johannes. That was an excellent discussion about cocktail robots. Amazing stuff. Thank you, Johannes. You're very welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Right on. We're taking questions on Matrix, and we've got some questions lined up already. And uh, I'm going to start right away. So what are your favorite ways to evaluate bartender robots? Ooh, I mean, there are so many ways. And uh, as you have seen in the presentation, they are so diverse and they have so many different approaches of what they want to achieve with their machines. So there is definitely one of the top priorities and people don't consider that when they build a machine for Robo Exotica is durability. Can you imagine? We have like always four days of Robo Exotica. Usually it starts Thursday evening. Thursday is a big night. We have probably between three and 4,000 people coming over the weekend to Robo Exotica. And can you imagine like even 500 drunken people trying to use a machine? Where's the button? What is going on? Uh, 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 uh. 
So most machines are broken within like two hours because they do not consider that drunken people will be a little bit rough with machinery. They probably don't even know how does it work, what's going on. So a machine even making it through four days of Robo Exotica without breaking is an almost winner, <laughs> it's a guaranteed winner. <laughs> And, uh, but then there are so many, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. Sometimes the design is brilliant and even the design is something that makes it uh, uh, a good candidate. So for example, we had one uh, machine a couple of years ago, the people, and it actually it's fitting to my outfit here, they, they made a pirate cave, you know, like they built a whole pirate cave and you could go into the pirate cave and there was this like, slumpy like old dirty pirate with a tube sticking out his mouth and you would have to dance for the pirate you would get pirate hats and you would have to dance to a pirate song and if you did the right dance moves so it was kind of like a wee control interface and if you did the right pirate dance for the pirate the pirate would puke grog into your cup and then <laughs> But I mean, the thing was just like just puking grog. I mean, the, the thing, the grog was disgusting, of course, but that was part of the whole thing that you get a pirate pukes into your cup. Uh, but the whole idea, the pirate cave, the song and everything, it was so brilliant, they, they definitely won. <laughs> but that is not comparable, for example, to a machine that is super efficient. Um, we had a machine for many, many years called Melmac. Melmac, like the planet where Elf came from. And that machine really made a solid 1,000, 1,500, sometimes 2,000 cocktails uh, over like one, two, three days. And they were really brilliant cosmos and screwdrivers and all kinds of uh, good cocktails. So they were fast and they were good. So they were also winners. But they were, of course, completely different uh, than the puking pirate, you know. <laughs> yeah, that sounds very creative, very creative. Um, our next question is, what is the minimum required proof to self-sterilize the machine and has it gone up recently? Well, I mean, the last Robo Exotica was last November. The cold COVID thing hasn't happened yet back then, but... Uh, there will be a new Robo Exotica this year. Hopefully, if we don't get the second wave, we are doing pretty well in Austria at the moment, but you never know if something goes well, everyone thinks it's over and then you get slapped in the face. But if everything goes well, this year's Robo Exotica is on the 19th of November and until the 22nd of November in Vienna at the museum's quarter. And we already have to deal with the fact how many people do we let into Robo Exotica this year? Do we have additional sterilization uh, techniques or something like that? Usually people at Robo Exotica, uh, they think already in the years before, they have been thinking about sterilization. Uh, we had machines where you have uh, just like the interface was pretty much like a sucking a vibrator and stuff like that. So uh, at some point people were really like keen on like not having like 2,000 other people suck the same dick, you know, and, and to get alcohol. So there's, uh, there was always a necessity uh, at an event like Wobo Exotica to think about sterilizing stuff. Self-sterilizing machines, we haven't had that yet. Sometimes we had machines that would, where you have to like suck something or we have to to um, um, just get in physical contact with the cup, or, uh, but it would be the cup that all the other peoples would use. Sometimes we had things that would kind of like dip the cup into a bowl, into a, like, like one machine was dipping the cup into cooking water, for example, for a couple of seconds and then lifting it out again. But that really depends on what the machine wants to do. Sometimes you change the mouthpiece or sometimes you change a part of the tube. Sometimes you have a cycle at the end uh, of the night where we had one machine that was making uh, white Russian. And you can imagine there's milk in white Russian and milk over like four days, if it stays in the tubes, 
it you know like milk gets stinky over time you know and uh, they had this like self cleaning mechanism that they would pump uh, like high like uh, like uh, like a kind of like 80% alcohol and hot water through the system every now and then to uh, to to clean out the the old milk and stuff like that yeah sure. yeah something to definitely uh, think about when you're building one of those machines oh yeah so the next question is how do we start this? And also, how do we not get closed down? Well, the question depends on where you are. If you are in the United States of America, the chances of getting shut down are high. In Austria, you know, like we don't have the over 21 years old rule for bars. At Robo Exotica, I mean, sometimes we have like 10 year old kids running around. Of course, we wouldn't give them alcohol, but you, we would have the kids there. They would look at the machines and we would interact. And I mean, we have the, the family afternoon on, on Sunday, usually at Robo Exotica, where the whole family with the baby stroller shows up and, and looks at all the machines. Many machines actually offer non alcoholic uh, uh, beverages. So, you know, like uh, just banana juice and Coke or what, whatever you can come up with. So, so there is not that the problem in Austria with this like strict Puritan over 21, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't happen. Uh, we did Robo Exotica in the US in the Bay Area two or three times. And uh, a friend of us uh, who was running bar games, uh, not bar games, uh, Robo games, uh, David Calkins. Uh, and uh, Simone Davalos, they were running Robo games for many, many years. And they added a category uh, bartending to the Robo games because of Robo Exotica and because they came to Robo Exotica a couple of years and really liked it. So they introduced the concept in the US. Uh, and then they also did for some years their own Robo cocktail event called Bar Game, uh, a Barbot. It was called Barbot. Uh, and uh, I've attended uh, kind of like two or three Robo Exoticas that we tried in the US and also the bar games thing. I always have the feeling that Vienna is such a perfect spot and Europe is such a perfect spot for that kind of stuff because people give less fucks about the whole thing. In the US, <laughs> it's just like the bars want to sell drinks and this and that and over 21 years. So it's so, it's so, like dampening in a certain way. So I never found that uh, cocktail robot events in the US that came up after we started it kind of like were super fun. There is one I heard in the DNA lounge going on right now. I've never been there and also they never contacted us in any way. So I don't know what those guys are doing and if it's fun what they think. I've never been there. But I, I think you need a certain level of anarchy going on and uh, Vienna can provide, although many people think it's very conservative, and Vienna can provide a certain level of anarchistic spirit <laughs> that is needed for cocktail robotics. <laughs> yes, you know, uh, Vienna and, and Austria, they were so centrally located. It's, a, it's really a great location. It's such a beautiful town there. So our uh, next question is, do you have nurses on call to take care of the alcohol comas? Well, um, most of the time we are the nurses. Uh, and I've seen weird shit going on. Oh my God. Sure. And I've dragged out many, many drunk people out of Robo Exotica. I have, I've seen uh, cocktail robot makers being very pissed of people puking on their machines and stuff like that. But yeah. honestly, that happens very, very seldomly. So most of the time I mention it in there. And of course, you tell the stories that are kind of like over the top, like almost killing the U.S. Embassy staff and stuff like that. But most of the time it is a very pleasant and very friendly and very consensual uh, uh, event and not that many bad things happen. Of course, people go there and sometimes they overdo it and they drink too much. And then, of course, you have to have some level of security going on. We usually have like two or three bouncers or something like that. And then they will take care if like people really start like taking apart machines because they are drunk. And it's like, mm, uh, you'll go outside, build, build your own machine and then 
take it apart, not other people's machines. But uh, yeah, but nurses wasn't really necessary so far. I can't even remember that we had a single kind of like paramedic having to show up at Robo Exotica. We had a couple of fire alarms though. So um, yeah, there, there were machines who started burning. That, that happens. I mean, if you do a machine yes. uh, and, and you create a machine that is dealing with liquids and electricity, uh, we had kinetic robots that didn't use electricity, but if you use electricity and liquids and, and bzz, bzz, sometimes fire, it happens. So we had fire, fire department people. Right, so what percentage of the uh, machines were powered by electricity in the wall or had their own battery power? Oh, battery power, uh, only mobile units. If you have something like a delivery machine that just like maneuvers around in the crowd, of course that stuff has battery powered or it's just like has some kind of Akku, as we say in German, it's uh, like two rechargeable batteries. Uh, but I would say kind of like 99% of the machines uh, were in some form uh, electricity based. We had a couple of but really nice ones that were really kinetic, that were kinetic machines that didn't use any kind of, of external uh, uh, power source, just like, you know, like some kind of like heavy rocks or something that right. just like moved onwards and use that kind of stuff. Yeah. There was uh, one picture in your presentation that had this big wheel with a handle. So I don't know if that was one of the ones that uh, you were referring to. But we've got one more question for you. Yeah. Uh, what was the most competitive game over the years or the at the Robo Exotica? Oh, the, whatever you do. I mean, humans are crazy. Humans. Uh, sometimes, actually, we have uh, cocktail robots for dogs, just like on, on the floor and the dogs come licking. But humans are very competitive. Whatever you present them with, whatever game it is, they will be fighting like it's like World War Three. It's just like all the games are competitive. And if people are inebriated, they're even more competitive. Just like I, I saw, you know, I, I, I presented the one thing with the, uh, uh, the laser tag, tag game. This was just like pure madness. People were like running around just like through crowds of like 20 people, like pushing them away just to, to peep. Crazy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true, and, and you know, you know, for some people, you don't want to get in the way of their drink. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, our, ne our next question, and we've only got a few minutes left. Yeah. Brainwave controlled motion would be nice, since you need to focus to operate. Has this been tried? Brainwave controlled motions. We definitely had like a couple already. Uh, a brainwave like EEG. Uh, controlled robots. There's even one in the presentation. Uh, it was like doing the perfect martini for you, a dry or not so dry martini based on your brainwave patterns. Uh, but we had, for example, um, a cocktail robot game that where you would control with your brainwaves, uh, kind of like a, a, a remote controlled car, and you would move the car around to deliver stuff. So that was really, really interesting. And that worked actually pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we're just about out of time. I really want to thank you very much. Uh, let me just make sure we've got all the questions. Uh, <clears throat> one more question. Then. Hope has had several talks about maker spaces. Have they participated or should they in Robo Exotica? Oh, oh yes. Uh, I'm very proud of Vienna because we have uh, MetaLab in Vienna and MetaLab was one of the First, like there is this you know, like Cambrian explosion of hackerspaces that happened in 2007 when it was when Nick Farr did the tour through all the hackerspaces and stuff. So, uh, uh, MetaLab was kind of like also one of those hackerspaces that became kind of like the blueprint of many other makerspaces. And MetaLab has been part of Robo Exotica since the beginning of of, uh, of MetaLab. So, Zwax, the the crap machine, not crap machine, crap the crap machine, yeah. uh, pancake yeah. machine. Uh, so Zwax is a member of MetaLab, for example. And some of the machines you saw, uh, they, they came out of MetaLab. There, uh, there are people like, there's this like wonderful uh, little maker space in Durango, Colorado, for example. And uh, people from there came to Austria to show cocktail robots. So from a maker space in Durango in Colorado. So yeah, maker space community, Hackerspace community, absolutely. We have seen many wonderful machines. Yeah, yeah. All right. 
Well, what we have well, not seen, oh, oh, one thing, challenge, yes. challenge. What we have not seen yet, what has not done yet, what has not been done yet is kind of like a defrag machine. We always wanted a machine where you put in a cocktail and it takes it apart, you know, like with a centrifuge or something like that, taking apart uh, the alcohol or the, the sugars and stuff like that. So like the reverse engineering uh, cocktail robot has not been done yet. A couple of people tried, but they were afraid that the centrifuge would malfunction. I don't know, but that has not been done yet. If that is a challenge, then it is. <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. Well, Johannes, on behalf of all the Hope 2020 attendees, presenters, and volunteers, we want to thank you very much for sharing your presentation today. It was a pleasure having you. And uh, in case anyone wants to contact me, you can find me. I'm the only person with my stupidly long name on the internet. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers.